To repeat, thanks very much for joining. We're going to be starting uh, promptly and look forward to um, your questions and, and comments and engagement. This is part of the We Robotics uh, webinar series that we've been holding over the past uh, 12 months now, um, highlighting how robotics, appropriate robotic solutions are being used in a range of applications from humanitarian aid to development in public health uh, across the world, including Tanzania, Nepal, and Peru. We've also explored how marine or uh, aqua robotics is being used um, around the world and some recent examples from Brazil as well. So my name is uh, Patrick Meyer, I'm the uh, co-founder of uh, We Robotics. And what I want to do to set the scene is just to give you all a, a bit of an overview on um, We Robotics to provide some context and then we'll hand it over to Alex, our main speaker for today's um, webinar. So if you're new to uh, We Robotics, we establish local flying labs like this Tanzania Flying Labs. Um, all our flying labs are run by local staff entirely who decide which projects and partners to collaborate with. And then we provide our labs with the skills, the training, the technology for them to take the lead. And they work very closely with local communities um, throughout their work. And later this year, the plan is for them to go to the Seychelles to do some work on nature conservation, marine life uh, conservation during counting of sharks and eels, as well as doing 3D models of the atolls and the Seychelles to look at possible impact of uh, climate change and sea level rise. Over at our flying labs in Nepal, our team there has also been using uh, drones or aerial robots for a range of applications, ecosystem monitoring to uh, agriculture. Uh, recently, they carried out a very challenging uh, disaster preparedness um, risk reduction project. Um, after the major earthquakes, you see major landslides like this one uh, were caused. But the challenge here is that people have been rebuilding in those areas, potentially rebuilding in areas that are even more at risk of further landslides. And so we were approached by a Swiss humanitarian organization to create a, a very high definition 3D uh, model um, of uh, the, the area for risk reduction. Um, and then finally, with our Peru Flying Labs, they've been uh, working with the Ministry of Health and the Amazon uh, Rainforest to uh, better understand some of the public health challenges and supply chain uh, challenges in the Amazon because you don't have any highways or roads, you have river boats, and so it takes a long time to deliver medicines. So our team has been using um, cargo uh, drones to deliver essential medicines, vaccines, type uh, uh, equipment and, and as well as um, uh, blood samples and, and diagnostic tests. So a journey that would take a riverboat uh, six hours um, would uh, only take this drone 35 minutes. And so quite a, quite a difference, um, as you might agree. So um, this has been really the very first time that cargo drones have been used in the Amazon rainforest, both for uh, day flights and uh, night flights. And so our, um, our local partners, doctors and so on, are very interested in continuing these, uh, these efforts. So uh, just to sum up, uh, the way that uh, we work is through our flying labs. They allow us to localize uh, appropriate robotic technologies and to uh, provide local capacity building to enable our local teams to take the lead. In the next year or so, we expect between one to three uh, new labs, <laughs> meaning in 2018, uh, to be launched, uh, starting with Panama Flying Labs in um, early next year. And one of the key things to keep in mind here is our labs are connected. They form part of a network, and that's where we have the kind of network effects that are so important, because then we enable our labs to collaborate directly through South-to-South -South collaboration and, and capacity building. That's really instrumental to our scaling um, uh, strategy. You'll see here, you know, we have a regional, uh, eight region strategy for our flying labs over the next five years. And the idea that these labs um, will be taking a regional focus and already are in fact in Tanzania, our flying labs there has already provided regional training to uh, other Africans and in, in neighboring countries. And, 
there have been requests from Uganda and Malawi and Mozambique for our Tanzanian team to be to be involved. So our flying labs are very much regional labs that help build the capacity of the region and support important um, uh, projects uh, in neighboring countries um, as well. Uh, we have a uh, code of conduct that we follow for uh, all our projects and training that our flying labs themselves uh, follow. This is uh, something you can learn more at, at our website at blueroboticsorg code of conduct. And um, this code of conduct is drawn entirely from the humanitarian UAV network's uh, code of conduct, which I spearheaded a few years ago. Um, this is also available here online. You'll see the full code of conduct there at the UAVators.org uh, website. This was a two-year multi-stakeholder open consultative process with dozens of leading humanitarian organizations from all around the world, including the International Committee of the Red Cross and numerous UN agencies, as well as other humanitarian aid and uh, development organizations. Um, and the reason I'm sharing this is because it's central to the work we do. So, for example, community engagement features prominently in this code of conduct and is really instrumental to, to all our work. And this is a, a good segue to today's uh, speaker, Alec, who's been doing some really, really important and uh, valuable research to better understand uh, how different local communities perceive and react to um, this new type of technology, which is really, really essential um, because all our work uh, really requires the buy-in. Even if we have legal permission to fly, that doesn't give us or anyone else ethical permission to fly. So understanding the concerns, the, the potential fears, the misunderstandings is, is really key because these projects are only as successful as based on how involved the local community is because they have um, the local knowledge, they understand the challenges and the priorities. So with that, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll uh, end my quick introduction and we'll ask uh, Alec to uh, start setting up um, his slides and to get ready for um, the presentation. Um, and while he uh, does that with, um, with Peter's help, um, just to, quick overview from the webinar introduction you saw. Um, he recently, very recently, carried out some uh, field-based research in both Tanzania and um, in um, uh, Malawi. And Tanzania was facilitated through our uh, Tanzania Flying Labs, and Malawi was uh, facilitated through some actually really good partners of ours at UNICEF um, Malawi. So uh, with that, Peter and Alec, are you all set? I'm here. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you loud and clear. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you very much, Patrick, for that introduction. Uh, I'll just give a brief overview of who I am and uh, what the research was about. So I'm currently an undergraduate at the University of Edinburgh, and this uh, Research came about as part of my undergraduate dissertation into community perceptions to humanitarian drone operations. And I was looking at Tanzania versus Malawi. And the reason I chose those two countries was a great opportunity with We Robotics, work with their flying lab and with Yusuf, um, a flying lab coordinator in Zanzibar. They were doing mapping of the islands with the Zanzibar Mapping Initiative. And then I had a great opportunity with UNICEF in Kusungu where they had launched their drone corridor and I was able to go to areas where they had conducted community outreach and sensitization but also to areas where sensitization was planned to go in the future. And the main uh, thing I wanted to get out of this was to see whether or not perceptions in the two countries were similar or were there were main differences between the two and if I could draw some broad recommendations on how outreach could be conducted in the future. So throughout this webinar, I'll just give a breakdown of the research that I've done and give a comparative analysis along the way. I'll first look at the initial reactions and uh, people's awareness of drones in both countries. I'll then move on to the applications of UAVs that are suggested by community members. And then I will do a comparison of the 
comfortability of certain use cases uh, as suggested by myself. Uh, finally, I'll look at the fears and concerns. I'll then wrap it up by drawing it all together and offering some recommendations, so I said. Okay, so without further ado, I'll move on to awareness of drones, which is the second slide. If we could just switch slides, possible. Uh, across the board, we had really quite high awareness of drones, uh, and that came from the Swahili word of Nindege, uh, which is an airplane with no pilots. In both countries, awareness was high, but it was the source of information of where people got this idea of what a drone was that really differed between the two countries. Uh, in Tanzania, people's source of information came from the radio and video clips and actual live viewings. Uh, for example, during the 2015 elections, they actually saw these drones flying over and being used by the government to take photos. Uh, but interesting, interestingly, the most common application was um, for the military use, so to strike terrorists. And a lot of people saw videos of these American drones, uh, often used by the CIA, in adverse comment, uh, to strike terrorists. Comparatively, in uh, Malawi, there was almost no awareness of drones whatsoever prior to UNICEF conducting their, their work, their sensitization. Um, and the, only 20% of the interviews, uh, of the interviews that I did people had never heard or seen a drone before, and that completely reflected the sample set, which was in areas where no sensitization by UNICEF had occurred before. So immediately you have uh, a big difference between the two countries, where one had had a lot of prior knowledge of drones, which had been filtered through from radio and video clips and actually seeing them before we were there. And then in Malawi, you had uh, people who had never seen or heard of a drone before UNICEF came and did their work. And I think actually you can uh, explain that by looking at mobile phone coverage. So mobile phone coverage was actually pretty high across, uh, well, mobile phone usage was pretty high across the two countries. So a lot of people had mobile phones. But in Zanzibar, uh, about 62% of people had access to the internet, and this compared to about 21% in Malawi. And really having that access to the internet means you can look at these videos, you can be on these forums, be on Facebook, and see the, you know, you have far greater access to more data out there. And that compared to Malawi, where very few people had access to the internet, and so weren't able to um, get this altered perception of what drones were like. And that's a theme you'll see running through the entire research is how I believe how access to the internet has really distorted some people's views of what drones can be like and how uh, they can uh, affect their livelihoods. So initial reactions were one of actual surprise and admiration across the board. A lot of people were really excited when they saw it and they expressed a lot of happiness seeing a drone. Uh, naturally, in, in Zanzibar, there was a strong association with military functions, and so several interviewees expressed some fear and concern about drones. Uh, and this uh, ranged from the, you know, the ability of drones to investigate people or to drop bombs from a chair far away. Uh, in Malawi, the biggest uh, association was actually not the military, but with witchcraft, which is something which was really interesting for me to, to research and to talk about. Because it is a, a real big problem in both countries, but in Malawi especially, I came across it far more. And people genuinely believed that there was, before they were sensitized, that there was an association between witchcraft and Satanism and these drones. And more people uh, also suggested that it was highly likely that people might conceive drones as witchcraft if there wasn't expanded sensitization. There were several reasons given for this. Um, one was that uh, witches make things that fly during the night, and so drones could in theory be made, made by them. And drones had no pilots, and a lot of people just couldn't get their head, head around how you could have something flying without a pilot inside of it. And so naturally they assumed it was, it was witchcraft. 
On the other hand, quite a few people uh, debunked this theory because they said that witches make things that fly during the night, and so drones cannot possibly be made by them. Uh, another said that witchcraft is intangible, you can't see it, therefore drones cannot be evidence of witchcraft. Uh, so I think that the key uh, thing you can take from that is that drones should be flown during the day where people can see them and they can uh, flown at an altitude that people can very visibly see them and see that it's technology. And that goes hand in hand with increased um, sensitization and community outreach so people get an education and an understanding of what these drones are and what they're here to do. Uh, I'll then move on to the applications of drones that were suggested by community members. So I asked community members to identify applications of drones uh, that would benefit their communities. And they gave a real wide ranging responses. Uh, the top ranking for each country, so in Tanzania and Zanzibar, it was mapping, and in Malawi, it was transporting medical supplies. Although, actually, you, that really does reflect uh, the application described to communities during the mapping initiatives going on in Zanzibar and the last mile medical care deliveries going on in uh, Malawi. So, the fact that they were the most frequently mentioned uh, does does make sense. Uh, under that, you had a lot of similarities between suggestions, which suggests that um, there are some common problems between the two countries. And uh, that's our agriculture, so irrigating crops, locating fertile sites, and monitoring outbreaks of crop pests, uh, for example, armyworm. Disaster monitoring was very popular, taking photos of floods, drought, deforestation. And criminal investigations, which was suggested quite a few times in both countries, and that ranged from monitoring of traffic ac accidents to personal security applications and monitoring the vulnerable and abused. And we'll come to that in a moment. There were uh, a, little, a few obscure um, suggestions, and that ranged from atmospheric monitoring and oil and gas drilling in Zanzibar to rescuing people during disasters and to prevent cheating in exams in Malawi, uh, which is quite, quite funny. Uh, so this table you can see up in front of you now shows the use cases that I suggested to the interviewee. Uh, so I gave them this table and I said, for each of these use cases, I would like you to say whether or not you feel comfortable with drones being used for that purpose in your community. And generally across the board, people were really, really happy. And we're very comfortable with drones being using for all of these purposes. And over 82% of all interviewees across the board were comfortable with drones being used for this purpose. Apart from transporting medical, uh, personal mail and government documents, and there's a clear disparity here between Tanzania and Malawi. In Malawi, 100% of people were comfortable with drones being used to transport personal mail and government documents. Uh, a lot of people said that this is a great expense for community cheats, uh, very time consuming and financially it is expensive to transport, um, travel into, into town to the district commission and deliver reports. Uh, also, there is a high incident of impassable roads during floods, and so generally they were really on board with using this to transport their personal mail and government documents. On the other hand, in Zanzibar, only 52% of people felt comfortable with drones being used to transport personal mail and government documents. And I think that this can actually, this reflects the use of drones uh, which they had seen on video. So they've seen drones being used for bombings and being used by the military and the CIA to spy on people. And I think there's that insecurity of people feeling that these drones could be hijacked or hacked, something that was suggested by one or two of the interviewees. And so they felt that it would be unsafe to actually use these drones to transport their personal mail and official government documents. And I thought that was really interesting, actually, because you have Malawi on the one hand, which is appears to be very accepting and open, open to using drones for this, for this use case. Um, but at the same time, they're less aware of 
what drones are being used for in other parts of the world, uh, for example, to strike terrorists. Uh, whereas in, in Zanzibar, where they had this increased awareness of what drones are being used for, they're really cottoning on to the fact that these drones actually have uh, weaknesses or can be used for ulterior motives. Um, so that was quite an interesting observation between the two. When it came to directly applicable use cases, so I asked uh, interviewees to identify the use cases which would be directly benefit, beneficial to their communities. And the highest ranking um, use case in both countries was transporting medicines and vaccines. So it can be seen that actually, if you had to ask them what do they need more than anything else it is, uh, which would be used, which you could utilize a drone for, it would be to transport medicines and vaccines. So last mile medical care delivery. Uh, alongside that, criminal investigations was really popular. And especially in Malawi, where there was a high incidence of um, abuse and a lot of vulnerable groups are targeted in, for example, beheadings. Um, they are seen, you know, orphans, children, um, elderly women, and bald men actually are seen as having properties which uh, have spiritual value. For example, the most shocking incident I found was in April 2017, there was a man beheaded outside of his front door. And it was because the perpetrators felt that his scalp could be sold in the body part markets of Tanzania and Malawi, uh, no, sorry, uh, Mozambique and Tanzania. And they could fetch a hefty price for it. And, you know, it's almost a get rich quick scenario. And it was, uh, it was generally felt that these drones could be used in a surveillance capacity to monitor these vulnerable groups and to prevent perpetrators from committing these acts. Inter interestingly, it was one or two interviews he picked up on the fact that actually even if drones weren't used for monitoring people, say were they be being used to transport medical supplies, the fact that they would be there and the fact that they would be in the air would help to deter perpetrators from committing these crimes, which is quite interesting because they're obviously seeing these drones and they're thinking, we're not going to commit these acts because we know that there's something flying above us. And that key difference between Tanzania and Malawi, where in Malawi they have less awareness of the negative uses of drones. For example, here in the West, we see drones as something, the surveillance of drones is very negative. We don't like being watched. Whereas in Tanzania, and that's something in Tanzania which they obviously feel the same way. They don't like the surveillance uh, element of drones. In Malawi, they're not aware of that, and so we're quite open to using drones for um, surveillance. There were quite a few similarities as well. Uh, monitoring of fast-moving crop diseases, such as armyworm, was very, very popular, and it's occurred several times in both countries in the past year. And it was something which, because the predominant occupation in both countries was farming, uh, it was something which is very key to the development of both countries, considering that they're both uh, quite, these communities are heavily dependent on farming and and crop yield year on year. Uh, so developing an application of drones that can benefit community farming uh, was seen as pretty essential considering how important it is to their livelihoods. I'll now move on to their concerns. So 70% of uh, interviewees across the board had some concerns regarding the use of drones in their communities. Uh, and this ranged from being hijacked or used for ulterior motives, such as bombings, um, they're all used for political gains. And they, the most popular uh, concern was that they could crash, they could fall out, the cra fall out the sky and damage people or property. And quite a few people, especially in Zanzibar, felt that these drones could explode and destroy the environment around them. And this idea 
that drones could explode and burn down properties. It, it, uh, it's not only drawing parallels with the fact that drones can be used to bomb things, but also some people felt that these drones had flammable components, which meant that if they did crash, they would set on fire and set everything else around them on fire. Uh, so it's quite important to, to mit mitigate that misconception that drones will explode upon crashing. Um, and a lot of people said if a drone crashed, they would run away in fear of it and they wouldn't approach it just in case it, um, even if it just took off in their hands, but mostly because they were worried it might explode or, or burn down something. Uh, when it came to breaches of privacy, there was a clear difference between the two countries, um, which is the next, next slide. And actually, I think that also comes back to uh, the use of the internet. The fact, uh, the fact that people in Tanzania, which you can see on the left-hand side, were on the whole uh, very concerned or even still just slightly concerned about drones flying over, for example, uncovered toilets, um, meant that they were far more aware that drones and images can be, for example, hacked, um, but they don't have ownership over those photos and they don't know where or who is going to be viewing these images. And so it was a great concern of those. On the other hand, in Malawi, you can see that generally people were not concerned about um, drones being, you know, being used to, to fly over and they were less concerned about breaches of privacy. And again, that could be due to the fact that they're less, uh, less aware of how the, the images will be used. Um, but also, they were far more optimistic about drone use and actually took it upon themselves to say these this shouldn't be a, an issue we drones should should always be flown in our communities and if this is if this is something which is preventing drones being flown it is a community responsibility to ensure that for example we roof our toilets so that these breaches of privacy are being resolved by a community led approach um, stopping drone operators from flying over and conducting their their programs, um, which was really interesting to see. Generally across the board, it's sensitization and expanded education, uh, which was the most important thing for moving forward. They just, there's a real desire to learn more about drones and to understand this technology but also to really get themselves involved with the drone operators. They want these drones to be part of their community. They're very open-minded and accepting in both countries. And they can all see applications which would benefit their community directly. But they say time and time again that you need to have expanded education and sensitization because you're always going to find people who don't understand it or take a negative attitude towards it and it was in both countries a lot of people said that without sensitization you're, you are going to have people which have negative attitudes towards drones and might for example throw stones to try and take it down and so it's very important to expand this education and integrate the local community and actually that's something i think we robotics did really well from what i saw differently in Malawi and Tanzania was that in Zanzibar you had the local flying coordinator Yusuf and then you also had uh, several of his volunteers and having that local knowledge and being able to pass on information local to local and um, meant it was a very streamlined uh, process of educating people about these drones uh, whereas in, in, in UNICEF with UNICEF uh, in Malawi Again, they were doing fantastic work, and it was working extremely well. Um, but sometimes there was an element of uh, a lack of understanding or misconceptions with drones um, because several things weren't, weren't addressed in the same way. So if I was to wrap up, um, it would just be that drones are 
have a huge potential uh, in the development of communities around the world. Um, perceptions of drones are generally positive and community interest is really high. There is a, a great desire among people to utilize drones to combat their own community problems. And the increasing connectivity means that people are more and more aware of how drones can benefit their communities. And you know, with every every month you see you're reading more and more about the humanitarian aspect of drones as opposed to the, the military aspect of drones, which is fantastic because people are becoming more and more aware of how drones can really benefit their countries and develop their countries and be integrated in, for example, their healthcare systems. The initial reactions to drones are generally wonder, curiosity, and then uh, slightly anxious um, and also fearful, especially with the associations with witchcraft or the military applications of drones. And these both fostered a, a negative perception of drones and uh, led many people to raise, raise concerns and worries. And this is a, a really important thing to target and to target these misconceptions and that will only be done through for greater sensitization and community consultation. Uh, the latter of these consultation would be a really great thing for drone companies uh, to look at in the future because things like uh, monitoring fast moving crop diseases which are so important to these farming communities aren't, I felt, um, in where I was studying uh, being looked at or considered in, in lots of depth, um, but it's a huge opportunity to, to tap into. Um, finally, uh, you know, across the board, it can be seen that you know, 80 to 90 percent of interviewees strongly agreed that drones could have a positive impact in their communities and would support the use of drones in the future. So, despite all the negative, well, not not so much negative, but the fears and concerns. They're very accepting to these, these drones and really, really, really want them to become part of their societal development and can really see a place uh, for drones in their, in their community. Uh, and that, that pretty much sums it all up. Um, yeah, so I'll hand it back over to you. Thank you very, very much, Alec. I mean, this is just incredibly uh, insightful and, and what's equally important is your findings um, really lend themselves to very actionable, uh, concrete, uh, you know, next steps that, that we can keep in mind. You mentioned, for example, the concern around uh, the, the drones potentially exploding and creating forest fires or other kinds of fires and burning down property. Um, that's incredibly important uh, to know, to to reassure communities and show them that, you know, the, the risk of this is incredibly small and maybe also a good insight for us to think about, you know, as uh, the gas power drones potentially become uh, more widely used, uh, that's a really very, you know, important insight to consider um, whether or not that's actually appropriate. Um, so that's, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for this. Um, I will hand it off, hand it over to our, our fellow participants. We have about uh, 20 minutes for any uh, questions, ideas, uh, suggestions you'd like to share. Uh, when you do so, please just um, first share your name and uh, which organization or group you are uh, with. So um, feel free to chime in. Uh, just a quick note, you'll need to unmute yourself or if you don't have a uh, microphone, you could type your question in chat. Can you, from Alana, can you describe the sensitization process that has already taken place? Um, maybe say a few words on that, both in terms of what you learned in, um, in Tanzania and in Malawi, Alec? Yeah, sure. So there was a couple of ways sensitization uh, happened, and it was more clear in, in Malawi, actually. Uh, so the first of that was through radio broadcasts. Uh, especially in Kasungu, they got on the local radio and they were able to talk about drones. The second way they also did it was um, having 4x4s four four literally driving through uh, different areas with speed phones on the back and that had two purposes. One, to make communities aware of when um, drones were going to be tested but also when community 
Um, outreach is going to uh, occur in, in separate communities. And then the third way was really uh, bring, getting community chiefs together at district uh, community meetings and discussing with the chiefs these drones and what, what their purposes are and what they're here to do and to tell their communities not to be scared or worried about them. And that um, communication with the chiefs at the chief level was really important because actually with these traditional communities, uh, people look up and listen to their chiefs um, somewhat more than they would do to a radio broadcast. And they were able this way to uh, you know, expand their outreach to a, a greater area than they were able to um, reach in just going and doing sensitization in their, uh, with live drones. And then uh, the final thing they did was go to these, uh, as I say, uh, separate communities with drones and actually fly them up and down. And then they often did presentations on uh, big screens which showed um, what the drones were there for and what they were and how they were a piece of technology that should not be feared but should actually be um, accepted. And there's a lot of ways that they could help their communities. Um, so that was just the various ways which sensitization was carried out in, in Malawi. Um, in, in Tanzania, it was a much uh, smaller scale, so the, the sensitization was carried out on an individual chief level. So prior to our arrival in different communities, uh, Yusuf would coordinate with the chief to let him know we were there and then meet him, and we would sign a, a register, for example, uh, saying who we are and what we were there to do. And as we were conducting our operations, we would then sit down and explain to locals what we were doing and um, how how it could help them. So, yeah, I hope that answered your question. Very good. Thanks, Alec. Um, I've received two uh, follow-up questions, one <coughs> from Jeffrey in Kenya, um, who points to the fact that a number of civil aviation authorities in Africa uh, are also biased uh, in terms of how they perceive this new technology, and so his question is, you know, what kind of training do you think um, one might be able to do to help empower them to potentially, um, you know, perceive it in this technology differently and, and engage in a more in a more constructive way? Yeah, well, that's a really interesting question, actually. Uh, in Zanzibar, I was speaking to Yusuf, and because they were trying to get permission to map the um, the local the airport. And when they approached the Civil Aviation Authority, the Civil Aviation Authority didn't know what a, a drone was outside of the military uh, applications of drones, uh, which meant that they had to do this education with the Civil Aviation Authority from a very basic level. Um, but it's, it's really important to get them on board. And I think it was a huge help for UNICEF to actually be based in an airport. So they're based out of the uh, Kasungu Airport. And it meant from the very beginning, in order to get these drones off the ground, you've got to involve uh, all the different parties which are going to be essential to actually making this a sustainable long-term initiative. And the Civil Aviation Authority is a very, very important um, element of that. And it was the Civil Aviation Authority alongside the Ministry of Information in, in Tanzania that were actually conducting, these, uh, conducting the, the sensitization and outreach. Um, so I guess, it is very important that you're integrating them into um, into the sensitization and also in the actual designing of a, a wide-scale program um, because without them signing off on it, you're never going to get a drone off the ground. And in Tanzania, it was, we got held back with many delays because the Civil Aviation Authority was um, not comfortable with the use of drones. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but... Uh, let me know if you want me to rephrase it in any way. Thanks, Alec. Jeffrey, def uh, <coughs> definitely let us know if you have um, sorry, follow up questions. I got another <coughs> question from Erwan, um, who is interested in knowing you know, how the, the resulting maps that are produced through these uh, projects, how are they uh, shown back to the, the communities? OK, so the maps are, were part of the Zanzibar Mapping Initiative, which is a uh, so, which is set up with the 
uh, oh, since name slips on mine, but it was a, it's a government department within um, within Zanzibar, and the maps are basically done on three kilometer squared zones, and they do that each block by block, and then they're stitched all together. But all the maps, the final map, will be available online, uh, as as far as I'm aware. Uh, Patrick might correct me on that one. Um, but the the maps will be available on a public uh, database, which can be accessed. Uh, but again, you've got the issue of people not having the internet capabilities to to see these maps for themselves. But it it was done through a, a public system as opposed to a private system. So these there is the, the capabilities of accessing the map when it's finally when it's finally done because that's what its main purpose was. Um, yeah, I think that's correct. Patrick might know more about that than I. Uh, no, that, that's entirely right. Um, uh, one of the <coughs> solutions that we have um, uh, experimented with in our Nepal flying lives, for example, to bring back those maps to local communities who won't necessarily have uh, a computer, a laptop, a smartphone, a, a tablet, is what we do is we print out all our maps on these very large uh, rollable banners that we bring right back to the local communities and in fact engage them further with uh, some community mapping work um, so that they're able to then add their own local knowledge to those paper-based maps that were generated thanks to thanks to drones but but you know bring them right back in, in a way that's uh, tangible and so I've seen that done in the Philippines uh, as well to kind of bra bridge that kind of um, of um, digital um, divide. So we've got about five or so minutes left. Um, I'm going to follow up with a question from Marga here from AFHI 360. Uh, she'd like to know how the communities uh, end up using the maps and how the perceptions change uh, over time and whether there's any plan to do that. Um, I'd venture a guess and suggest and, and perhaps say that that might have been somewhat beyond the scope of, of your research and, uh, and your research questions, Alec, but feel free to chime in if you have um, any input on that. Yeah, sorry, can you just re repeat the question um, if possible? Sure, yes. Um, she writes that it would be really interesting to know how the communities wind up using the maps and how their perceptions might change over time. Yeah. Um, no, it's something which was it's slightly beyond the remit of um, the investigation, but how the community used the maps was actually uh, very important, the, especially actually it came up more in, in Malawi than it did in, in Tanzania because uh, demarcation of community boundaries was a, a real hot topic for these local communities who felt that there's actually a very blurred line between which community plots are owned by which individuals, and especially government land versus public land uh, around the airport in Kasungu, it, they felt that these maps, with that access to maps, they'll be able to map out which plots of land are owned by which people, which chiefs are in command of which area of land, and so you could clearly demarcate where public land ends and, and uh, government land start. So that was one use of maps which would directly benefit communities. And again, the the map use of maps is actually can be done on a quite a uh, simplified level by literally getting chiefs together at district commission meetings and sharing the maps directly at chief level. And that means that they can disseminate the maps back in their own communities uh, in a far faster way there in areas where for example, internet connectivity means that people cannot connect to the internet and download and use the maps themselves. So by having these maps at a district commission level, it means that uh, community chiefs can then use them in their, in their own communities. But the demarcation of community la uh, plots of land was really, really important in key for people. Uh, quite a few people actually mentioned that there was a high rate of stealing of crops and livestock and a number of chiefs actually mentioned that they had been called in to resolve disputes between two landowners who said that, that this this area of crops was theirs and actually he was stealing it from the other the other farmer. 
Great, thanks for that, um, Alec. Really appreciate it. Um, I think we'll have one last question. This one from Shaban um, in Dubai, um, who asks, <coughs> "Why do you think there's such a difference between the drone perceptions um, between the communities in Malawi and uh, in Tanzania?" I think in, in part you had mentioned internet access that might potentially be an explanatory variable. Uh, in any event, it would be great to get more of your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think uh, I haven't been able to. Um, well, yeah, from what from what my preliminary findings are suggesting, I think it you really can uh, point your finger at internet connectivity as a, a key explanation for why there are these differences in perceptions, because it means you have a preconceived idea of what a drone is, and um, before the humanitarian aspect aspects are. Um, introduced to you. So in Zanzibar, before the mapping had occurred, people are already aware of drones through a negative angle. You know, they're associating it with um, the CIA using to spy on people or to drop bombs, and they were watching these videos. Whereas in Malawi, there was just not any any knowledge about drones before UNICEF there. So they were able to introduce drones on a completely clean slate and introduce people to the humanitarian beneficial uh, ways of drones without them having a preconceived notion of the negative connotations. And that meant that in Malawi you could see people being very open-minded and very accepting of drones and all their applications and they were more likely to see the straight to the benefits of them and not, not think of um, the negative associations with, for example, bombing them. In Tanzania people had this this notion of negative, uh, yeah, of negativity with with drones, and that meant that they it heavily influenced, I think, their their answers in certain questions. And the um, transportation of government documents and personal mail is a is a key example of that. So yeah, that's what I that's what I think now. But uh, I'll have I have best part of a year to uh, go through all my findings in detail and listen back through to all of my interviews to see if there's anything else which I can gain from it. That sounds great, Alec, and maybe we'll uh, um, love to have you back um, as you, you know, wrap up and consolidate everything and see uh, what else you have learned from this uh, research. Um, I'll give uh, just one more opportunity. If there are any final burning questions, <coughs> feel free to chime in on the IM or on uh, voice call. Okay, well, Alec, thanks so much again. Really appreciate it. Uh, you'll also find everyone that uh, Alex kindly uh, authored a, a guest a blog post that's available in our Robotics blog that also summarizes some of these main findings that he's very kindly shared with us today as well. Um, so there's further uh, research available on the Weaver Robotics. Um, blog, and feel free to get in touch at any time if you'd like to connect with uh, with Alec. We're more than happy to to, to provide a, an email intro as well. And uh, Alec, thanks again. Really, really appreciate it, and look forward to uh, seeing where the research takes you. No worries. Thank you for this uh, amazing opportunity. I thoroughly enjoyed my my time with We Robotics and and doing this uh, webinar. So I hope you all found it as uh, insightful as I did. Super. Thanks again, everyone. Thanks, Alec. Have a great week.